Hello to all you Trek Guardians out there. Captain Foley and Commander Cocking returning yet again with an amazing guest star, Mr. John Eves, everyone. Ha, yay, hi. Hi, John. So, welcome back, John. It's always a pleasure to have you here. So, Today we'll be discussing one of the Enterprise lineage that Mr. Eves brought to us. No, not the Enterprise E. That's in another episode. No, today we're going to be looking at the Enterprise B from Star Trek Generations and talk about a ship that could almost be considered a one-hit wonder if it wasn't for its iconic registry number. Now, just to be clear, we are doing a full Trek Yards episode on the Excelsior and all of her progeny very soon. So this is just an episode with the designer himself, uh, which, as always, gets into the design process and all the behind-the-scenes stories, etc. So all the facts, numbers, and stats on this ship will be presented in the regular episode. But let's get right into the conversation and not wait until Tuesday, as we have all the information today. Um, most of you will get that. Some of you will not. Even though, ironically enough, we are filming on a Tuesday, so it is Tuesday. It arrived with the medical department and the photon torpedoes. Let's proceed. <laughs> well done. <laughs> yeah, that's right, guys. So, as we all know, the Enterprise B is a variant of the sleek Excelsior class we first saw in Star Trek III. Yeah, so, John, tell us about how you got involved and, and got you know, picked to do this design for Generations, and did you feel any pressure about designing the next Enterprise and the next Enterprise to come after Kirk's Enterprise? There you go. Well, the way, way it started, I was a model maker at the time. I worked at Apogee and Boss Films. And uh, I had met Herman Zimmerman through a friend of mine, Phil Edgerly. And uh, uh, Herman needed someone to make him some models of the Enterprises. And so Phil recommended that I made them for him. So uh, I called him up. He goes, I'd like a model of this, this, and that that I can display. And so I go, all right. So I made him the models. And I did a drawing of how they laid out on the, on the stands. And he goes, oh my goodness, you can you can draw as well. I, I might need you at, at one particular time or another. So uh, we hung up, I dropped off his models, and he was very happy. And I never thought anything would happen. And one day he called up and he goes, one of my illustrators, Jim Martin's moving on to movies and I need a replacement in Deep Space Nine. So, uh, all right, I'll take it. I was, I was so excited to get into the art department. I'd only done one drawing job before with Sequest with uh, Mr. Spielberg. And, and uh, it, was, it was fun. That was something I always wanted to do was get in the art department. So Herman gave me that opportunity. And about four, three or four episodes into Deep Space Nine, uh, the news of Generations, the movie, came up. And he walks by and he goes, would you like to work on Generations as well as the show? And I go, yeah, that'd be great. He goes, okay, first thing we got to do is we got to make a, a new Enterprise. And, uh, and uh, I go, wow, that'd be awesome. And he goes, we're, we're not making a new model. Really Budget-wise, we can't do it, but we're going to turn the Excelsior into the Enterprise B. So start thinking about it. And he walked away, and that's kind of where that started. Was there any pressure like to design the next Enterprise, or was that just all excitement? I, was, I, I think I was, I was too naive to feel the, the pressure of it, and uh, I was just used to getting things thrown at my desk at that time. And it, it sank in later, like, wow, I'm working on, a, on an Enterprise. This is fantastic. And, and uh, basically, the Excelsior was, was one of my favorite ships, so uh, Bill George had, had uh, done the building of that. And it was a different time, I, I think I'd mentioned one time, but... Uh, in those days, there wasn't really an art department for all that stuff. ILM was kind of in charge of the effects, and they would design the stuff as well. And what they would do is they'd make a series of study models, lay them out. And uh, the director would walk by and pick which one he liked. So uh, Leonard Nimoy walked by and goes, oh, I like that one there. And that's how the Excelsior came to be. And, uh, and I remember when it hit the screen, it's like, oh, that is the coolest ship I ever saw in my life, that beautiful, sweeping, long starship. And uh, so it was, it was a great treat to have, be able to turn that into the Enterprise B. I thought it was a, a really great idea to use that as the base. Cool. So we okay. got a lot of pressure, and uh, it was just we moved on. Perfect. Okay, now we know this is a design variant to the Excelsior class. Um, the Excelsior was launched in 2285, with the Enterprise B being launched in 2293. Can you please explain some of the major differences? Um, and was it class as an Excelsior class refit or its own designation? And did the art department have any, you know, in-house in name that, that they called it? Uh, as far as the classes go, that was something we didn't we didn't deal with. That was in the writing department or uh, or the effects department. That that would would find out when the movie came out. Most of the time, uh, later films we we were a part of that that process. Mike Akuda and Herman Zimmerman would would kind of come up with ideas, and uh, that would kind of help determine where it would go with the writers. But as far as the Excelsior Enterprise B went. There was really nothing that was brought up when I was working on it that it was going to be a different class. As far as I knew, it was just Excelsior, and we were doing a, a retrofit of it. It wasn't meant to be a different ship. 
it was meant to be just a retrofit, and that was something we we're very familiar with in the Star Trek world. So, but um, there's very script-oriented design elements that were going to determine where the ship went. And um, being that it was going to be a motion picture, a new motion picture ship, uh, we had to do things that would be added to the existing model as opposed to really architecturally changing the ship. We had to do things that could add on, be very easy and affordable. And um, the one particular element that we had come up with was Kirk has to get hit by a lightning bolt from the, uh, the energy ribbon. And so um, it couldn't be the saucer. They didn't want that. They didn't, uh, the script kind of called for it being near the deflector dish. And um, just looking at the, at the ship and the stuff, there's no way to do it without blowing up the entire ship. You just couldn't pick the side uh, without causing a lot of damage. So um, thinking about this, I brought in a model of, an old air World War II aircraft called the PBY Catalina, and it's a flying rescue boat. And it has this beautiful boat bottom, and uh, here I'll show you a miniature of it. And so this is a model Ed Marecki built for uh, uh, ILM, and they wound up using this in some of the Deep Space Nine episodes, a smaller model and easier to film. And so uh, I added this detail on the front that kind of matches that PBY, and what it does is it makes a lip so the energy ribbon can hit it without wiping out anything except that particular area of the ship. So you get that damage in there, the deflector can still work, and everyone's okay except except Kirk. And so that's where that design element came. And what was nice about it is it, it altered the architecture completely to take it from the Excelsior world into an Enterprise world, a whole different ship without doing a lot. So this was the only major detail they actually had to alter on the original model. And it was basically an add-on, a, a very busy one, because they had to tether it with... Uh, with fillers and stuff to make it work. So, so John, I, I, John, are you telling us that the main detail for the Excelsior refit, you know, this this iconic bit was pretty much just built to kill Kirk. But yes, the, exactly. It was yeah, refitted to kill Kirk. was put there to kill Kirk, so. <laughs> the whole ship was basically designed to kill Kirk, is what it was. So, <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. But after that, everything wound up being uh, add-on elements. So uh, it was easy to get a big parts and just stick them on the, the Excelsior take them off and it'd be the Excelsior again. Unfortunately, the body couldn't be altered back, but it was kind of at the end of its run. So there you go. Did you think uh, we should we just, we should just make a name, a class for this ship, I think. Let's call it the Eves class. <laughs> Probably That was not. actually Samuel's <laughs> idea from earlier, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't want to do that. So when you got word that you were designing the you know, Enterprise B, did you think the Excelsior class as the next step made sense, or were there any alternate designs? Because you know you tend to sketch variations. Were there any other variations, maybe in the, in the first day that you thought, ah, oh, let's let's do this uh, to the existing model, or any little pieces that you thought that'd be perfect to add on that just weren't able to put on due to budget, which obviously, as you talked about, is the main reason why they had to reuse the Excelsior. Um, anything different? Um, no, uh, from from kind of my point of view, it was it, it seemed logical that you'd go with that. And working in the model shop, I knew how that budget, budget thing worked. And so I thought, well, if they have to do that, it's an excellent choice. So I didn't think much beyond that that's a great idea to use the Excelsior part. And there wasn't a lot of choices either. Uh, you had tons of the uh, um, Constitution class that, you know, it wouldn't work. And uh, I, I'm not sure, but I think the C had been drawn at that time. I, I, it might have been. I don't recall. I think there was a TNG ship. And that one couldn't go anywhere because it was very specific. And so the Excelsior made sense that it was a great looking starship and it was easy to adapt and it was available. So that's kind of how that was determined on, on the use of it. And I never thought twice about it not being in the right or the wrong place. It just seemed correct. As for any alternate designs, was there any details that you thought they'd be perfect that they just couldn't put on due to budget? No, uh, ironically with this, this ship, everything we drew was very specific and uh, Herman was right next to me. So he would always come out and add notes. And Mike Akuda uh, sat behind me, and uh, he was always a gentleman. He would never, like, put his advice in unless you asked. And so I'd always ask him, I'd go, hey, you know these ships, could I ask you about this? He goes, oh, I was hoping you would, because I had some comments I'd like to say. So he, he would add a lot of advice as well. But our whole point of view was to make this ship identifiable um, from different views. So you know the Excelsior from the top to bottom every way. You'd see it and go, hey, that's the Excelsior. So I needed to, my job is basically to design something if you look and go, that's kind of the Excelsior, but it's not. And so uh, on the saucer, we added these two huge, they want to be called impulse engines in the end. But originally when I was drawing it, I, I kind of wanted to expand that transwarp drive, and that's kind of what that was. That was kind of an extension of that, that 
that technology in a thought process kind of way. So that's where they came from. And of course, the main impulse engines were the ones that are already existing in the center of the back of the strip. So, uh, but when they did the breakdown, they named those uh, impulse engines. So uh, that's kind of where the definition came from. But originally, trans warp, trans warp drive stuff. And uh, then to change the cells, we added some fins on the back, added a kind of a cowling up on the front. And one detail I really wanted, I drew it in, but it didn't make it. There are these two little fins up on the top of the, two little dorsal fins on top of the saucer. And uh, they didn't make it in the end. And I, I guess they had already been removed for other incarnations of the ship. But uh, that, was, that was one, the only detail that I had drawn in and didn't see it in the final version. So, and then, of course, they changed the paint a little bit. Uh, the Enterprise B was an Excelsior refit, or a retrofit, as you said. And uh, yeah, we saw original Excelsior-class ships in TNG and DS9 battle scenes, despite the film Generations coming up before the Dominion Wars arc in Deep Space Nine. So the refit existed in terms of design and physical model. We know the refit in the form of the USS Lakota appeared in the later DS9 episode, but why did we see the Excelsior-class uh, and not the refit in every battle scene? Uh, there was um, a kind of a distinction at Paramount and CBS. It was Viacom at the time, but they tried to keep movie properties separate from TV shows. And if they had a hero ship in the in the feature film, they would necessarily not use it in, in television unless mm -hmm. necessary. And it wasn't very often. But the battle scenes um, were mostly done at Image G uh, for uh, Deep Space Nine, and they had a whole slew of models over there. And one of the ways they could scapegoat around using a hero ship was to change the registration number and the name of the ship, so they could use the the Galaxy class uh, and so on. And they could get model kits. They'd use model kits as opposed to the filming miniatures because they were huge. They they would range anywhere from six feet to eleven feet. And Image G it was just an enormous process to do that, especially with the lighting, because they'd have to do all this lighting. Their blue screen wasn't that big. So it was easier to make smaller models, and if they could get a kit, they would use use kits. And so that's kind of why you won't really see a motion picture ship in a television show because they kind of keep, like I said, they kind of keep that property separate. And for filming reasons, it was just a major, major event. Well, we do see, you know, the Akira and the, and the Steam Runner and, and Sabe in DSI uh, battle sequences, but I, I guess it kind of makes sense because, as you say, they used um, smaller models, you know, commercial models for the Excelsior because they've got the Lakota the, or the Enterprise B model, but it's that huge, you know, nine footer. So I guess filming that would be too much for the DS9 battle. So I guess that's probably the main reason. True, uh, probably so. And they were also right in the verge of going from computer to uh, our um, practical miniature to computer CGI models. And so you see a mishmash of that kind of thing. Uh, they weren't completely at that realm yet. Uh, the end of Deep Space Nine did the did the switch. Uh, the very I think it was the very last season, and then of course Enterprise was all CG. But they were right in that that edge. They could uh, if they had the models from ILM, you know, it was, it was something they could use and they could put it in the background. As long as like background stuff, it wasn't a big deal. Um, and so that's kind of how that world was determined. And a lot of the guys that do the effects. You know they they're not up on the on the uh, the the history and the, the fan stuff like we are, and uh, so they had to do shots. So they put ships together. We got these models. Let's use these. And the the uh, uh, effects director we had at Paramount was Peter Lordson at the time, and he was all about you know making sure the shots worked and stuff. So that's kind of how that that world came together. If they had it, they could use it. They'd have to go through approval process. Can can we use these ships? Their background. As long as they're background, they're cool. And that's kind of how that worked out. Can you think of an in-canon reason, though, why only the classic Excelsior was used rather than the refit? Because, I mean, surely it's the refit. We only ever see refit, you know, Enterprises. Uh, probably because they had this model before it was the beam. There was a smaller Excelsior class. And uh, um, I think it was originally built for uh, background shots. For but why in canon, John? Why in the universe did the refit... I know. I know. It's because it's the flagship, and they probably only built like five. It was like a sub-series of ships that were kind of <laughs> experimental and never really caught on, maybe? Who knows? Yeah, exactly. And and, and again, uh, this world changes weekly between what writer's on, what director's on. So uh, as we're, we're staff, and we're always there, so we know these things and think about it. New guy comes in, and uh, he's kind of got a whole new world to catch up on. And Rick Sternbach and Mike Akuda made this Bible book that would as close as possible break down the stuff in a quick reference for the writers and stuff and like i said every every week something was different so with new people coming in and going and so uh they'd be guided as best they could but a lot of those decisions were just made on what looked good in the shot and that division probably kept that cannon ship from being in the uh 
in the shows because it was established in a motion picture as an Enterprise B, and they didn't want to crisscross it. So we, apparently, it was supposed to be an individual single ship. Yeah. But we did actually see the Excelsior refit in episode DS9, like we mentioned earlier, in the season 4 episode 12, Paradise Lost. Now, keep in mind that this episode was based in 2372, while well, Enterprise B was launched in 2293, so it's a 79-year gap. That's a very old ship. Um, and this, the USS Lakota, was said to be, uh, or was, was the first Excelsior refit we'd seen apart from the Enterprise B. And despite this 79-year age gap, the Lakota was actually heavily upgraded with new phases and a complement of new, brand new, quantum torpedoes, which were first seen uh, a year before in 2371. Uh, the, Lakota, the Lakota was also equipped with new enhanced shields and was able to take on the USS Defiant, which, as we know, is a pretty powerful, meaty, meaty, uh, meaty? meaty ship, um, uh, really does show the Lakota's enhanced abilities. So I know you're not necessarily responsible for these um, your decisions, uh, John, but you know why do you think the Lakota or the Enterprise B version was seen for this episode specifically? And how does it feel to see it again, even in the small screen, um, and in one of the, the handful of Starfleet on Starfleet battles? Mm -hmm. Well, most of these things happened in another, another world which is across the, the studio a lot, which was another world. We had our art department and construction. We were together and we teamed up. And what happened on the other side a lot would usually go without us, us knowing. So as far as effects would go, if it didn't directly relate with us, we didn't know. So it was a surprise just to see it on the screen. Like, oh gosh, look what they used. They used that one for that particular scene. And again, it was a model they had. And they, uh, like I said, whatever made the, the shots work. Like the last episode, 175, where... They had this alternate universe where everything went back in time. Oh, that's that's the JJ world. Sorry, but uh, uh, no, uh, no. It was basically what they had on the shelf and what they could, what they had available to them at the time. And uh, they obviously broke their own rule of not keeping a ship canon at that point. But that was our rule that we had. That's canon. You can't use that one for the show. And it looked cool. It was cool though. It was nice to see it again. So yeah, and it was the same with the sets because we'd have the TNG sets that we used for. The movies, but we had to alter them to a certain point where they wouldn't be the same. Okay, so I've got to ask: in the Enterprise D briefing or conference room, we saw the models depicting the evolution of the Enterprises. Yes, of course they did. The, they had no NX01, and they did use the Andrew Probert Ambassador class model. But can you think of an in-universe reason why this model might have been a classic Excelsior design rather than your design? If indeed this wall was meant to represent the different Enterprises of history, we at Trek Yards like to think that that wall was merely the prototype wall. <laughs> 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 True. Well, a lot of this stuff uh, came out of the art department. And so Herman would do the sets, or uh, be the overall designer of the sets, hit up set designer design, and Mike Kuda would jump in uh, to do the graphics and stuff, and then the set designer. We were all in the same room. And so uh, this actually happened before I was there. But the way the process would work is probably probably Mike and Rick Sternbach were probably behind that, that entire wall. And they probably, let's do this, let's use this. Uh, let's put the Excelsior in there. And it probably wasn't meant to be a full Enterprise line, but they probably assumed that would be a good ship because they uh, they had a design for it. It was a canon idea. So I think they were probably reaching when they put that Excelsior in there, and they might have been the reason it was the Excelsior that was the retrofit. And so... Um, oh, so that's destination why... paradox, as it was. Yes, exactly. So uh, <laughs> a lot of future things came out of those 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 early ideas, and having Mike and Rick there... Uh, was just genius because uh, they know the shows backwards and forwards and uh, it's a great passion for them. And so uh, I'm, I'm sure that they probably determined that, that future without even knowing it. And uh, that's why it's the classic Excelsior, not the, not the B, and it was already established. And so to make something like that on the wall is a big deal. So, <laughs> Excellent <laughs> so they answer. stuck with it. Yeah. yeah. So one of the big uh, changes, as you say, between the original and the refit, see, guess which one is which. <laughs> <laughs> is that the you know the addition of the new impulse engines and actually longer warp engines? So you know um, when you design this in the universe of Star Trek, how much faster maneuverable would you think you know your refit be over the classic Excelsior and even over the the original Connie refit? You know, how much stronger, better, faster? How much of an improvement was your refit? Do you think to the original version? Um, uh, it, the one point of, of thought I thought when I saw the Excelsior is it, it, it shaped just from that one point of view you'd see it in the space dock and when it when its engines go out, it looked frumpy from that point of view. You know, from the side, it's extremely sleek, but you don't see it from that point of view. Mm -hmm. And that was the reference I had at the time. And I thought, uh, look, I, I'm a huge fan of, of aviation and going out to Edwards Air Force Base, looking at all the X-planes and stuff. All the fastest jets had fins on them. So I thought that the more fins I could put on it, the faster it's going to look. 
and and uh, and so uh, that's why on the rear of the nacelle you got fins all over the back as opposed to anywhere else. And like I said, at that time I had only seen those, that view of the the Excelsior from the motion picture or the third movie. And so when we got the models, I was like, oh my gosh, it's super sleek already without having to add that stuff. But it was done at the at the time to kind of make it look like it was a little bit more faster, a little bit more powerful ship. And just by accident, putting this uh, architecture on the bottom, it, it kind of lended itself to looking a little bit uh, more faster as well. So, but, but in general, how much of an improvement do you think your design was in Canon? Was this the really the next generation of, of Warship or just a slight improvement? Uh, just a slight improvement. Uh, uh, I didn't want to alter what Bill had done originally because mm. it was so beautiful. <clears throat> and I didn't want to take it into a whole new new world. I wanted to keep the lineage alive and, and just enhance it as opposed to change it. And so that was my point of view. And especially when you look at uh, other ships, especially uh, the Matt Jeffrey stuff that we do for Enterprise and stuff, mm. we'd have this opportunity to redo the Tholians and the Klingons and stuff. And you, you don't want to take it too far from the original. You want to keep the homage there. And uh, so it was the same with the Excelsior turning into the B. I didn't want to alter it to the point where it was 100% different, but just enough that it was more of a retrofit. It is fair to say, though, it's much faster, much more maneuverable, because that's a lot of extra engine power you've added to the back in terms of impulse. I mean, that's over doubling it, you'd think. So. Mm. Yeah. Now, you've already mentioned that the protrusions on the secondary hull would avoid damaging the actual model when the Nexus energy ribbon, ribbon hit the ship and killed Kirk. But this, in fact, didn't work because I've heard that the glue they used to attach those protrusions did, in fact, damage the original Excelsior model. As a fellow model builder, I'm just curious as to what kind of glue you use for those kind of modif model modifications. And uh, for that matter, what materials were used in creating the actual filming models of the ships? Uh, a lot of stuff uh, is a uh, fiberglass base. It has like a gel coat, which is a, a, a plastic layer. And then they do a fiberglass to keep the shape. And then they do an internal structure of aluminum or, or metal to keep the shape. Then the lighting goes inside. Uh, on the exterior for detail, you'll use anything from a, a, a body filter like Bondo to uh, dental acrylic, all kinds of material. You use a version of hot or a, a, a super glue called cyanoacrylate. And it's an extremely tough glue, especially back then. It's changed, the formula has changed, but back then it was like concrete. And uh, the trouble with this particular addition is it had to feather into the body. It couldn't be a segmented piece. And so there you got to use a filler. So it's a big gamble that it would not come off without damaging the ship. And uh, from ILM's point of view, they had to they had to do it. And then I think, like you said, when they tried to take it off later, it, it was it was there's no way to do it. So, <laughs> so you got battle damage without having planned battle damage when you pull a piece off. But it's just the material you you can't you can't get around adding something to a yeah. beautiful piece without destroying it. And of course, you got to sand that area smooth. Yeah. For the for the glue to, to adhere, so and the materials. So you got the also you had two versions of it. You had the clean version, and they built a giant section just to that that front section where they could put the brass edge in and give you the more more detail. And add the little optical element of uh, them standing there looking out in space. So a lot of times it would determine uh, uh, what the shot was, what the size was going to be. And the, it was the same with the Enterprise A. Before it was the A in Rathacon, they did close up details of the areas. For the patches and stuff. Mm. So, so was the was, was the Excelsior model like uh, irreparably irreparably damaged because of that, or did they actually restore the Excelsior model back to its original? Uh, as far as I know, it, it, it stayed that way. Uh, I, I I I couldn't tell you for sure. I'd have to look okay. at, the, at the. I think it sold as the B, not the Excelsior. Oh, and I think there was only one. I think it sold as the a Lakota. Actually, I think it was still that by the time it was done. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah, I think the Lakota had been done because I had, I went and photographed that model, and I think it was before it had become the B. So, yeah. So this is a hard question, but uh, could could be amazing. So if you could go back in time, John, and you had no money restrictions, I'm talking billions of dollars <laughs> for your company. Is it anything you do different with the design apart from make it solid gold and platinum? Um, perhaps if it was all CG, you know, is there anything you could think in retrospect that would have been cool if you had done to really make it, you know, a more unique ship? Again, budget, no problem. Um, when you look at the Excelsior compared to the Enterprise, the original Enterprise lineage, it is very different architecturally. It's meant to be a different ship. Right. And uh, what um, they did with the C is they kind of did a, a C actually came after the Enterprise D, and what Rick and Mike did is they did a morph of the D and the A. 
And so that's where that came from. So most likely it would follow that kind of idea for, for a bee. Um, and uh, they're all drawn out of order or designed out of, out of order. So uh, you'd have like a future ship to use as, as a bearing of where the architecture is going and kind of do something in the middle. But uh, I hadn't thought about doing a different ship. That probably would be the direction. Okay, we need to do something in the middle that lines, lines things up. Um, which would be kind of fun to, to do, but mm -hmm. okay. it was the chosen Excelsior, that's where you went. But as you can tell when you line them all up, it's the only one that has a completely different kind of... Is there anything you would have done, oh. is there anything you would have done to the, the B model, though, to make it, if you had, again, no budget restraints? So, so if you had to keep the Excelsior, is there anything you would have done differently to the model to make it a bit more interesting? Uh, probably, probably not. Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> Can't think of anywhere I'd go with it. Uh, yeah, there you go. Good. Maybe more fins, like the ones on the uh, yeah, saucer section. Yeah, just a fin, the yeah. saucer on the front. Um, now, are there any other stories or behind the scenes things you can think of about designing the Enterprise B or altering the Excelsior model or shooting or anything? We just we love little t tidbits like that. So, any interesting stories? Uh, I, I was working on the phone with uh, primarily Bill George at the, at the time, and uh, he was kind of supervising this. John Goodson was kind of in the model shop. He he and I became a bit closer work-wise uh, friends as uh, First Contact came again. But I was always a fan of Bill George. I remember I would read about him. And, and the very first Cinefix that hit Phoenix was number 13. I want to say 13. It was the Return of the Jedi. And he was like in every other picture. So he was like the model king at the time. And so uh, he was kind of a hero. And to hear that he was behind the Excelsior and, and going to be a part of the retrofit, that was, it was a great treat to, to meet him. And so... Uh, I'd send uh, the drawings over, and he'd go, okay, this will be cool. We can do this, we can do that. So, uh, And uh, he would add, him and John would add their own stuff, like on the top of the uh, transwarp unit that's the impulse engine. There's four little kind of inset uh, hmm. details. That was something that they came up with. And so uh, there you go. <laughs> so that was one of their little additions. So um, as, I, as I was saying, you know, when I get these projects, I don't want to do a, a full 100% perfect drawing because I want the next guy to be able to add his creativity and not be locked into something where they're kind of not allowed to do that. And working in the model shop, we were always kind of forced to follow those drawings and you go, you know, it'd be cool if we did this or did that, but you could never do it. And so I always wanted to leave that door open as far as collaboration goes. And um, it was just brilliant what these guys did. That's all I can say. Cool. cool. So last of all, John, um, the you know, each enterprise has made its mark in history. I mean, the B and C a little bit less because they were on you know the show so briefly, um, and we never got to explore their full potential. So we know from the Star Trek TNG technical manual, the Enterprise B was a ship of exploration and charged 142 different star systems, which is awesome, uh, and it made contact with 17 different species. You know, first contact, which is again really good. Um, mm -hmm. What was your personal take on what you hoped uh, you know, for the Enterprise B going forward? You know, in terms of what happened in its lifetime? Uh, is there any story you would love to have seen the Enterprise B? And of course, how did you feel, you know, knowing that this ship was indeed the the one that 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 uh, killed the legend of, of uh, James T. Kirk? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, you know, you always wanted uh, the the grandeur of the original series was they did a, a lot of the episodes were exploring, mm -hmm. and you know, they'd go to these strange new places. And uh, I always wanted to see our ships do that. We've kind of gotten to the point where there's an ultra bad guy mm -hmm. in every story now, and that would that's what guides Star Trek as opposed to that big grand, like the, the motion picture I thought was just fantastic because it was an exploration thing. The bad guy was exploring this fantastic body in space and uh, Khan kind of set the tone for the bad guy. Four kind of broke it with the, with, the, with the whales and stuff, but you always had the sinister bad guy that kind of dominated where the stories would go. And I always wanted to see him in these fantastic, brilliant space backgrounds that, as opposed to just a planet or a little galaxy in the background. Nemesis was cool because you went in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the nebulas and stuff and the same with uh, Insurrection when you were in the briar patch and that was kind of the, that was kind of the highlights for me watching it go in these different environments. Now Samuel, we know that the Enterprise B did in fact discover and fight the Terror Bird. They didn't know it was a Romulan ship though, but that's a, that's a Star Trek Originals episode. <laughs> Yeah, we'll have to show yeah. you that one, John. We have a we have a designer, Michael Freitas, who built an amazing Romulan design as part of the originals uh, for the Indiegogo. We actually built a full backstory behind the ship, had a three D model created, and then uh, because it made sense timeline wise, I decided let, let, let's let's say the Enterprise B. You know, th it was designed to face the Enterprise B, and so I've gone yeah. done some animations of it closing in the Enterprise B. But don't worry, your your ship got some good shots and managed to survive. So don't worry, the Enterprise B lives on. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh, very good. And it was kind of fun with the uh, back to the ILM story in the model shop. Uh, the scene was going to open with, with it being launched out of the uh, the space dock. And so they brought the space dock model over from the warehouse and a huge crate mm -hmm. the size of a pickup truck. And uh, it had a panel on the side that opened up and you could look in, you could look inside. And uh, it had a board on the bottom about two feet and then this thing hinged and you open it. So we open that up and we look in and there's no model. We go, where's the space dock? It's gone. And up at the top of the box is a, a, a bolt and a, and a bar and just a chunk of the space dock. And we're going, what the heck? Who, someone took the model. And then we look at the bottom of the box and just the, them moving it. It was so fragile. It was just a pile, all billions of parts at the bottom of this, this box. And so uh, they shipped it up to ILM. And that's why you have the smaller yeah. space dock because it was impossible to put it back together. So that's why you got the custom space dock for the Enterprise B salvaged of scrap plastic and metal in the bottom of a box. That's interesting to know, but I'm kind of cringing now. That's, a, that's a, <laughs> such a sad ending to that. You should have been there. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. It's like <sighs> that was oh. kind of the, that was kind of the way with all the models because they'd store them at this warehouse called Cantera, yeah. and they never sat in one place. They're in a box, and depending on how they were packed, that either survived being moved twenty times a day, or they wouldn't. And many times you'd open the box, it's like oh, oh, and so Bird of Prey was one that was always destroyed. And the Enterprise B had a board that went under the saucer and the body. And when they drop it, clink, it would kink on that point. So every time you pull out of the box, you'd have to fix it before you could photograph it or what have you. Well, on that negative note, crew, there you have it. <laughs> An insider's look at the Enterprise B and also a sneak peek at some of the information that we will be presenting in our Excelsior class episode. As always, it is so cool to talk to the actual designers who worked on Star Trek and hear all the backstage stories like that one. Uh, that, and such that went into these amazing designs. If anyone had told me even a year ago that I would be here on Trek Yards talking to all these great people in person, I would have told you that you were crazy. You would have but, been crazy. But Samuel and I are proof positive that if you love something and you put some effort in, amazing things can happen. All that being said, thank you very much for joining us today, John. It's always an honor and a thrill to have you here, and we look forward to many more episodes with you in the future. And a very big, uh, thank, you, and a very big thank you for this episode specifically, John. Thank you. My pleasure, and you guys are great, and I'm a fan of your stuff. So uh, we're all great fans, and it's fun that we get to participate in that stuff. So good, good times. Well, thank you. <laughs> in the meantime, guys, please check out, uh, please visit uh, trekyards.com and check out past episodes, crew bios, and a lot of other fun stuff. Or join us on Facebook uh, as we share Starship pictures and other great ship-based discussions. If you enjoyed this episode, please click the like and subscribe button to jo and join us again very soon. This is Captain Foley, my first officer. Uh, Commander Cockings, that's me. <laughs> and Admiral John Eves. Until next time. Bye, everybody. See ya. Bye. Right, thanks, guys.